But now let's look at verse 22. Now we're going to come across an illustration here. So I'm going to try to group all of this together and uh, pay attention. Remember, you want to understand every single word. That's the point of this whole study. For it is written. So Paul's saying in the scriptures, it's saying this. What do we learn from the Bible? That Abraham had two sons. Yep, we know that Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, right? So we know that. If you know your Bible, do you know your Bible? Okay. If you don't, then you should join the kids downstairs on Sunday school. Okay? Okay. Know your Bible, friends. Know your Bible. All right. Ishmael and Isaac. Some of you are going, who's Ishmael? You know? <laughs> don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> All right. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. The one by a bondmaid. That's true. We know that Ishmael's mother, Hagar, was a bondmaid. She was a servant, a slave. The, the other by a free woman. That's Sarah. She's a free lady. Now let's look at verse 23. But he who was of the bondwoman, so Ishmael, who came from Hagar, was born after the flesh. So Ishmael, he's born after the flesh of Abraham, which is true. So Paul's calling this flesh from Abraham. But then notice what he says about Isaac, which is different. But he of the free woman, so Isaac, who's born from Sarah, was by what? Promise. So that's the difference. I, Ishmael, all he was was, I was just born from the flesh of Abraham. But Okay, even though you're born from the flesh of Abraham, that don't mean much. The key is right here, promise. Isaac, he was not just born out of Abraham's flesh. He was born out of this one, promise. Amen. That's the idea. Now look what Paul's going to do to exemplify a Christian here. Which things are an allegory. So Paul says all these things are an allegory. Now, before I continue, this is one of the rules. So this is something that you want to know and mark down. This is one of the most important rules of biblical interpretation. So biblical interpretation, I was thinking about maybe teaching it at advanced discipleship, maybe one day. But one of the biblical methods of interpretation, which you should know, which will be eye-opening for you, is allegorical. That is very important. Allegorical. So the Bible says that all these things are an allegory. I think I should color this in green. That way people don't get confused. It's one of the most important rules of biblical interpretation. If you don't believe that the Bible contains allegory, then you're going to come across a mess of doctrine. How so? Oh, for example, the Roman Catholic Mass. When Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have eternal life, that costed a billion souls in hell. So I think this is important, right? So allegorical. If they knew that that was just an allegory, what Jesus said, then they would have been more careful. Here's another factor you want to keep in mind. Why this is also very important is because a lot of people, especially onliners and even Bible believers, they get into a point where they stress about literal interpretation, which is very true. It's one of the rules of biblical interpretation. Literal is actually one of the primary first rules, literal interpretation. However, the thing is, is that we all, by doing literal interpretation, we downplay, we ignore the allegorical interpretation. And that's very dangerous. You don't want to do that. I have seen, the reason why I'm stressing this so much is because I've seen so many people at the Bible school that I've been attending or even online who took this kind of approach where allegorical approaches are so negative that they've conjured up their new doctrine and they made a big deal. They became nitpicky out of that and they caused controversy and splits among churches. So I want to warn you, never fall into that route. Never fall into that route. It gives me great joy when I have members in my church who are literal Bible-believing Christians, and then we all have a wonderful and a fun discussion talking about unicorns of all things for two hours, all right? No, don't say amen, all right? Don't encourage me on that one. So 
It's, it's one of the most wonderful things ab about literal interpretation. But at least my members know that when I talk to them that uh, you got to be careful here and here and here, they know that. So then they'll back off. Why? When you take too much of a literal approach, it can be a dangerous thing. We had one person, for example, who, uh, who took the verse where the Bible says, if you don't confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, you have the spirit of Antichrist. So he took that verse literally, and he was asking every Bible believer at Dr. Rutman's church, and even at the blowout of all things, do you believe that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, according to 1 John? And they're like, yeah. And then he's like, no, 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 literally, like right here, right now. Right here, right now, he's here in the flesh? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't. You got the spirit of the Antichrist in you. What in the world, man? That is dumb. No, if he knew the Bible is old classic English. Is come is actually a reference to past tense, if he knew that. See? A famous example is a Christmas carol. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. What does that mean? That the Lord is here right now or in the past tense? See? So, see, that's the problem. Not only that, remember the Catholics who had their Catholic Mass. It becomes very dangerous. So be very careful. The Bible, it's rich in allegories. You might say, why is that? Why? Look at Jesus Christ. How much of it was allegorical, huh? With parables? Do you think he meant that literally with his parables right there? So you got to be careful of that. So allegorical interpretations are a key rule in Scripture. Here's another thing. Another thing about allegorical interpretation, which is important for you to understand, is that sometimes people have a difficulty believing in a doctrine because you give it in an allegorical interpretation, not literal. Now, this is important to understand. You might say, why is that? The reason why is this. Some people feel like I need a clear verse where it literally says it this way for me to believe. If you give me an allegorical interpretation for it, then that means that it's invalidated. It's a wrong interpretation. No, that's not true. Sometimes you got to understand that the Bible gives it in an allegorical method because he wants you to study for yourself. He doesn't want to just say it literally and clearly where you can go, oh, okay, I understand. No, that's just too amateur. God wants you to study for yourself. Amen. Allegorical interpretations is actually more rich than literal. Didn't you know that? You might say, why is that? Because allegorical contains so many rich metaphors and symbols that you search more cross-reference words more occasionally through that. And when you look at picture similitudes, allegorical interpretations, you find more wonderful things, rich things. Paul, that's why when he's arguing right here about an allegorical interpretation of Hagar and Sarah, he's not giving a literal interpretation. So that, can, so that is going to be often used by Jews against New Testament Christianity. So this is very important to understand. When you're trying to prove Jesus is the Messiah, and you quote verses proving Jesus is the Messiah, if you're honest and you take it literally, it does not have any application to Jesus, some of them. For example, at the book of Psalms, David says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The thing is, is that that's the psalmist crying out. That's not Jesus. But we New Testament Christians take that passage to say, no, this is a prophecy concerning about Jesus' death on the cross. But Jews, they don't see that by the context and by who's speaking. It's obviously the psalmist. It's not a prophetic interpretation to Jesus. Yet, why would we claim that? Why we claim that is because it's shown at the book of Matthew, Jesus saying that. So see, by comparing scripture with scripture, we know that the psalmist was giving a prophetic interpretation. Not only that, because we also know that the book of Psalms contains prophecy as well. So sometimes even though the, uh, the prophet, even though he'll be speaking about himself, sometimes in a prophetic mindset, when they're speaking about themselves, they're speaking about another person. That's how prophecies work. See, but you wouldn't know that if you only had a literal mindset. Amen. So you need to see a richness of context, historical uh, knowledge, as well as scripture with scripture. See, that's why it's so important to understand about allegorical interpretation. They're very important. So the thing is this. Allegories are important because Paul used it quite often, especially in this passage, to prove why the Christians today 
They are the real spiritual Jews, not the nation of Israel. But he can't prove that unless he used it allegorically. See that? So that's how Paul argued is through allegory. Allegory does not make it a weak argument. Jesus Christ spoke very often in parables. That doesn't make his statements weak. So you got to understand that God, he talks in this manner because he wants to see you study, 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 study. All right, let's go back right here. Let's go back. Which things are an allegory? So then you might ask me, okay, so then how do we know which allegorical interpretation is correct then, Pastor? You're right. That's a good question, legitimate. Because do you know how many false prophets are out there, Alexandrian scholars? And uh, sorry, I have to point him out, William Lane Craig, he's so shallow in Bible knowledge. Such a brilliant mind concerning atheists. But the reason why he has such a brilliant mind is he's so used to being eloquent in speech and then taking certain statements and arguments and you coming up with clever ideas to make it allegorical. So whenever certain passages are used from the scripture, he always interprets it allegorically. So that's very dangerous. That's an Alexandrian text mindset. So then you might go, how do we know then, Pastor? Very simple, but it's actually not as simple to do. But it's simple to know. Simple, study your Bible. But it's not as simple to do. But you can tell whose allegorical interpretation is correct if you study that book over and over and over. You have a great familiarity of the writer, the historical context, the words, the words, because you see words repeating quite often. And then you look at the symbols and the pictures that God used occasionally, repetitively throughout the Bible, and you can see a certain method here. You can see a certain track right here. It's like a detective and a person who does DNA. Even though you're just seeing pieces, which is abstract, if you keep connecting the pieces together more and more and more, and you're fully familiar, so you're so used to doing it, you can come up with a logical conclusion and even great evidence. So that's the same thing right here. All right, I discussed enough about allegorical interpretation. I hope that that has been very eye-opening for you when you study the Bible in the future. It's going to be helpful. Okay, so he's going to give an allegory at verse 24 concerning about Hagar and Ishmael. He's going to try to prove why this side is important and why Christians are the real spiritual Jews. For these are the two covenants. So Paul's saying that these people symbolize two covenants here. The one from Mount Sinai. Okay, so there's one that Paul argues is, going to, is the covenant of Mount Sinai. Ah, wait a minute. What came from Mount Sinai for the Old Testament Jews? Uh-huh. The Ten Commandments, the law. So we can see where Paul's going right here. Now let's keep reading. Which gendereth to bondage. Okay, so that word gendereth, what it's showing right here is like giving birth to a son. So we know that Hagar, when she gave birth to a son, what? It was in bondage. Why? Because she's a bond woman. So when God, so Paul's arguing right here that the one that came from Mount Sinai, it gave birth to bondage here. Now, if you remember Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, the whole context, what did Paul keep saying about the law? It's bondage, right? So we know that he's definitely talking about the Old Testament law here. So we're not going to look at those verses. Let's go back. Which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Okay, so that's Hagar right there. Uh, just a quick side note, for some people who wonder, okay, I don't understand why in the New Testament God spells the people's names differently from the Old Testament. You ever notice that? So Hagar is with the H at the Old Testament, and then in the New Testament you see just an A. The reason why is this, is because if you know multiple languages, then you'll understand. If you have a experience translating multiple languages. If you translate from Hebrew to English, it's different especially from Hebrew to Greek to English, then it's going to look different. And the King James Bible, it came from Hebrew, which was translated to Greek, and then from Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to English. That's why we ended up with Agar. See that? It's not just Hebrew to English right here, like the Old Testament. Okay, let's keep reading. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Okay, so that, remember that. Paul says, okay, so then Ishmael's line, which came from Hagar... So remember, the bondwoman is Hagar here. He's saying that's the Old Testament law. 
and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. So, notice right here that Agar, or Mount Sinai, has to answer to Jerusalem, the other person, which now is. So Jerusalem is here present tense right now. Huh? Let's keep reading. And is in bondage with her children. So Hagar is still bound. The Old Testament law is still bound to her children. Now, remember, the comparison was with the bondwoman and free woman. Hagar and Sarah, right? So then this Jerusalem, which is this opposite party, we can guess right here that this is going to have to refer to Sarah. But it's strange why the Bible would call her Jerusalem. Why is that? Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Because it's talking about the new Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, not the Jerusalem of Israel today. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Notice in verse 22, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, what the Bible says that the same people, they're come unto Mount Sion and Jerusalem, but it's not referring to the one in the nation of Israel today. Look at verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the what? Heavenly Jerusalem. And to what? An innumerable company of angels. Okay, so we know that this Jerusalem is not referring to the earthly Jerusalem today. It's referring to God's heaven. Now, if you know your Bible, and if you've been paying attention, actually, to the Galatians verse-by-verse -verse commentary, Paul's trying to prove that we are the genuine people of God, the genuine Jews, all within what context, remember? Spiritual, right? So this is all within a spiritual context, remember. Remember, Paul says, is it literally physically or did he say it allegorically? See that? So that's what he's trying to do. He's put it all at the spiritual plane over here. 